come to the Master's Touch even song service. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord. expecting to receive tonight? Well, if not, you won't receive anything from the Lord. Elevate your expectation level and open your hearts to receive Him. Let me explain Evensong for a minute. Evensong is primarily done through song, and the songs contain or point to the message. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we're bringing you our Evensong service tonight, and we pray that you enjoy it and will, will join us often. As we begin our worship tonight, Take a second to assemble a small piece of bread or cracker, a piece of, a piece of food of some kind, a, sm a swallow of some sort of beverage or juice, and it can even be water. Set it aside, because later on we're going to pray over it, sanctifying it as the body and the blood of Christ. Right now, let's worship our King.
We're studying our identity in Christ, and we're delving deeply into who we are in Christ. Now, this journey into our identity has brought us to God's mercy. Tonight, I want you to take a look with me at uh, developing faith for the mercies of God. Now, at this point, we've gone over this a few weeks now. At this point, I can almost hear you thinking, well, if God's mercy is following me and his mercy brings all these benefits of God's presence into my life, why am I not experiencing all those benefits? There's a simple answer to your question. It's not enough to have God's mercy directed toward you. Like everything else in this Christian life, your faith activates that mercy to bring it into manifestation. Now the Bible is full of, excuse me, full of promises for believers, promises of healing, abundance, peace, safety, and so much more. And yet most believers never see those promises come to reality. Not in their lives anyway, because, because they never develop faith for those promises. Listen, my friends, faith is the key. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 tells us that it's by faith that we're saved. Listen to this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So according to Colossians 2 verses 6 through 7, we must live the Christian life the same way we got saved, by faith. As you therefore have received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk with him. I'm sorry, let's start again. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. In other words, you successfully live the Christian life the same way you started it, by faith. Romans chapter 1 verse 17 echoes the same truth. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, if you're born again, you're justified, all right, because Christ justified you, and you're now righteous. So you're the just, and you need to live by faith. And now you can begin to see why so few Christians experience the benefits of God's abundant mercies. Why? Because they have no faith either to receive these benefits or to live in them. On the contrary, they have faith in the idea that God is mad at them, that he's out to get them, that he's just looking for an opportunity to zap them. Well, let me tell you something. It's not any wonder, then, that so few believers can really understand the mercies of God. My friends, the good news is that you can make a change in your life starting right now. How? Well, according to Romans 10, verse 17, by hearing the word. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There is one side note here that I need for you to know. The original Greek uh, documents and manuscript says, So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christos, not Theos. Theos is God, Christos is Christ. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Faith doesn't come by hearing the word of God because that would encompass all of the Bible, including the Ten Commandments, whereas the word actually says faith comes by hearing the word of Christ. That doesn't mean to throw the baby out with the bathwater and leave the Old Testament Ten Commandments out altogether, but your faith is built upon the word of Christ, as the original transcript says. So, this is another one of those translator oops. In the previous lessons, we got a small sampling of what the Word has to say regarding God's mercy. We saw scripture after scripture declaring how God's mercy endureth forever. Amen. I mean, you probably got sick of me saying it, but the Lord is good and His mercy is, endures forever. In fact, this phrase is repeated 42 times in the Old Testament alone. Wow, that's a lot. We also discovered that God's mercies over all of His works, 
Now, as we saw in Psalm 145, verse 9, and we saw how God's mercy literally is in hot pursuit of you in Psalm 23, verse 6. So, my friends, you need to meditate on those scriptures and get these truths planted deeply into your spirit. As you hear the word concerning God's mercy, faith in that mercy will come. And then, and only then, will you begin to see a full manifestation of his mercy in your life. I want, I, I want to warn you here right now that uh, though your natural mind will not want to accept the reality of God's mercy, it won't, you know. Both your mind and the devil will be telling you how unworthy you are for God to be doing anything good in your life. But unless you get a firm, unshakable revelation of God's mercy, the devil will always be able to rob you of your confidence before God. Without an understanding of mercy, every time you try to step out and do anything of spiritual value, the enemy will bring up every mistake you've ever made in your life. That's why it's so vital that you get this truth firmly established in your heart and mind. And once you do, the devil doesn't stand a chance. Remember, he is a spiritual outlaw, and his goal is to keep you contained in fear, chaos, and condemnation. For example, when you prepare to go into the presence of God and receive his promises, the devil will try to shake your confidence. What he'll do is he'll remind you of some sin you committed a long time ago or even one just minutes ago. But if you're grounded in God's mercy, you can just cut that devil to shreds with God's word. No, devil, you're a liar. I'm a child of God, and his mercy is over all his works, and that includes me. His mercy endureth forever. I've confessed that sin, and I put it under the blood of Jesus. God's word says that because I have confessed my sins and given my life to Christ, I am a new creation in Christ Jesus, and now I'm bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. You have no power over me at all. Jesus stripped you of all your stolen power at the cross and gave that power back to me when he restored me to the blessing. So in other words, my friends, don't go around declaring your unworthiness to receive the presence and promises of God. Instead, do what? Speak out that you are worthy because of what Jesus did for you at the cross. That's right. And as a result, you are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and have been seated with him in heavenly places. Here's your evidence. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, and Ephesians 2, verse 6. Do your homework. Okay. You have to realize that God doesn't see you the way you see yourself. You see, if you're born again, God sees you through the blood of his son, Jesus. He isn't looking at you alone. He sees you in Christ. And I want you to get a powerful picture of this truth, so go with me first uh, to the first chapter of Ephesians and note every instance of these kinds of phrases in Christ, in him, or in the beloved. And you'll find these descriptions about being in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Ephesians 1 verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Ephesians 1 verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 1 verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1 verse 11, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Ephesians 1 verse 13, in him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1 verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Are you beginning to get the idea that being in Christ changes your standing with God just a little bit? Well then, quit calling yourself unworthy. You know why? It's an insult to the grace and mercy of God, that's why. You know, my friends, reading and hearing the word confirming, or confirming, but concerning God's mercy is vital. It, it's actually vital. But to develop faith in the mercies of God, you need to take another step and begin to meditate on the word. Psalm 1 verse 3 says that a man who meditates day and night on the word is like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall all, also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Meditating on God's word doesn't mean sitting cross-legged on the floor, humming and chanting for 12 hours a day. 
Bible meditation simply means dwelling on or pondering a portion of God's Word. You can be doing this while you're taking a shower, driving your car, cooking a meal, or even drifting off to sleep at night. As you're mulling over God's Word throughout the day, something powerful will start to happen in your spirit. The Word will begin to take root and bear fruit. What kind of fruit? Faith fruit. You know, the psalmist, David, knew a little bit about the Hasid, or the mercy of God. Many of the psalms focus on that. These psalms uh, actually make ideal scriptures to meditate on. I'm going to give you a list now of psalms that are excellent meditation fodder. Psalm 25, verse 10. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. Psalm 31, verse 7. I will be glad and rejoice in your mercy. For you have considered my trouble. You have known my soul in adversities. Psalm 86, verse 5. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and, and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Psalm 103, verse 8. Verse 11, verse 17. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. As a child of God, my friend, your heavenly Father has an inexhaustible supply of mercy toward you. You can't wear it out and you can't outrun it. Once you get this truth into your heart, developing faith in it will never be as difficult uh, as it has been. It won't be difficult at all, actually. And this brings us to yet another term in the Bible, which is linked to the said and agape of God. The word is compassion. Now let's talk about the power of compassion for a minute. The first part of Psalm 145, verse 8, it says uh, a verse we've already examined. I know that, but it makes a clear relationship between compassion and mercy. Let's look at it again. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. Now, as you know, Jesus was a perfect representation of the heart and the nature of God. Jesus said, He that has seen me has seen the Father. John 14, verse 9. So you don't have to look long at the life of Jesus to discover he was a man of compassion. Here are a few verses showing us Jesus being moved with compassion. Matthew 9, verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Matthew 14, verse 4. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them, and healed their sick. Matthew 15, verse 32. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And... I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. Matthew 20, verse 34. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Mark 1, verse 41. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, and touched him, and said to him, I'm willing, be cleansed. Luke 7, verse 13. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said to her, Do not weep. Over and over again in Scripture, we see how Jesus' compassion moved him to meet the needs of the people. Now, if you want to understand the heart of Jesus, you must start with an understanding of his compassion. He described his mission as one of coming to seek and to save that which was lost. Okay, so when you think about that, uh, that was, I'm sorry, that was uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 10 so that you know where you're going with this. It came right out of the Bible. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> what, when you think about this, what does this have to do with the presence of God? My friends, it has everything to do with it. Understanding the compassion which God is, has actually toward you is going to totally change your attitude towards spending time in His presence. You know, as we have seen, it's only in His presence that you can enjoy the benefits of healing, prosperity, peace, and power. Right now, if you desire to come into the kingdom of God and dwell in the miraculous presence of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, if you desire to be in Christ and avail yourself of his marvelous wisdom and power, his healing, everything that he has to offer you, his attributes, his statutes, you must give your life to him. It's very simple, and it's pain-free. And in just a moment, I'm going to give you that opportunity. And humbly left your throne 
to reach someone like me. If you had not walked upon this broken ground, where on earth would I be now? If you had not come. to know Christ as Lord and Savior, sincerely repent of all of your sin, acknowledge and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, and offer up this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I come to you as a sinner and surrender my life to you. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for me and set me free for all eternity from all my sin. I believe that you rose from the dead and sit at the right hand of God the Father. Take over my life and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I renounce the devil and all sin. Lord, I receive from you the gift of righteousness, total forgiveness of all my sin, past, present, and future, divine health, wholeness, and restoration, your protection, your direction, your provision, and your peace, and the gift of everlasting life. I am yours, Lord. Come into my heart and take over my life. In Jesus' name, amen. My friends, if you prayed that prayer with me, then you're saved. Welcome to the family of God. Rejoice.
Behold the Lamb, I will worship. Seated high upon the throne. Behold the Lamb, I will honor. Magnify the Joy and laughter, the love that I'm after, the only thing that matters to me. There in sorrow, he sees my tomorrow, his ear is always near. Behold the Lamb, I will worship, seated high upon the throne. Behold the Lamb, I will honor, magnify the whole. That's why I'm standing, my story's ending, the passion that compels me to go on. things that we receive from taking Holy Communion is healing of our bodies and our minds. If there's an issue for those who take Holy Communion and don't receive their healing through it, that issue is rooted in lack of knowledge. You know, we must prepare before taking Holy Communion, and the first thing that we absolutely must do is discern the body of Christ. 
That means that by acknowledging that the bread or whatever you're using as the body of Christ is the vibrancy of the life of Jesus, his supernatural healing and wholeness, and that because of his body and blood, you are supernaturally, you've become bone of Jesus's bone and flesh of Jesus's flesh, that you are now filled with his perfection and power, completely healed, healed, completely made whole, and completely restored to divine health. You could think of it as a pill if you want to. It's glowing with the Shekinah glory of God. It's healing you as it travels through your mouth and down into your body. As it's going down there, it's pushing out all darkness, which is sickness and disease, from the inside out. Now visualize the condition you're plagued with, the sickness or disease being on Jesus' body. Put whatever the ailments are on him. Use your imagination. You're not giving him something he doesn't want. He already took it at the cross, remember? You see, the enemy's trying to trick you. He's trying to trick you into taking it. How? By deceiving you into thinking that you've got it through lying symptoms. But since Jesus took it already at the cross, you're already healed and made whole. So put those lying symptoms back on Jesus right in the same place on him that you've been afflicted. In other words, see yourself with the solution. See yourself without the problem. This is called spiritual visualization. It's vitally you understand it and do it. Now, the next thing we do in preparation is discern the blood of Christ. We discern it as the forgiveness of all sin, past, present, and future. Hallelujah. As restoration of the blessing to your life, the power and the authority of God in your life in full operation. Glory to God. As receiving God's provision and protection. As receiving the gift of righteousness from Jesus Christ, thanking God for his plan of redemption and that you have been included in it, and that you've been given eternal life, life everlasting, and now you no longer live under the law, but you live under his grace. You see, as born-again believers, we have Jesus' bones, and we have his flesh, and through Holy Communion, we have his blood. Hallelujah, we are complete. Now, lift up the elements of the covenant before the Lord as I pray. Those are the things I asked you to gather together at the beginning of the program. Father, we praise you and worship you with these elements of the covenant. We thank you that your only begotten Son gave his life sacrificially so that we may live and have life more abundantly. We thank you now as this bread becomes our portion of his healing body and the vibrancy of his life within us. We thank you that as we partake of the body of Christ, we speak grace, grace over it, knowing that that will redeem us from any sickness, any disease that might be trying to plague us. We'll become healed, made whole, completely restored. We thank you that this beverage becomes our portion of his cleansing blood, that we are continually washed in his blood and renewed within as we perpetually remember his act of love on the cross on our behalf. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. You know, the Lord's Supper is a personal fellowship. It's actually a partnership with Christ. And partaking of one bread creates partnership between the members, the disciples as well. It merges us all into one body, and that's known as the church. Now, the Word of God commands us to eat the bread and drink the cup. Continually take bread, give thanks and break it, and eat it. Then take the cup, give thanks and drink it, all in the remembrance of Jesus. Now, the Lord commanded that the supper be repeated often, and yet Paul doesn't give us instruction as to how frequently the Lord's Supper is to be celebrated. However, he does imply that it's to be on with frequency, so that partaking of the Lord's Supper continually recalls to our mind our redemption by Christ from all sickness, all disease, and all sin. Do it as often as you want to and need to, my friends. As we're instructed, we discern the body and the blood of Christ as we prepare to partake. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you that this bread has become the healing body of our Lord Jesus the Christ, the body of our Lord Jesus, broken for you, so that every cell, every tissue, Every organ and bone, all systems, neurological, blood vascular, lymphatic, muscular, skeletal, all of them are totally aligned with God's word and his will. That you are and remain healed, made whole, and totally restored to divine health and wholeness. In the name of Jesus, our healer, the Christ, we pray. Amen. Partake of the body of our Lord and Savior. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, <clears throat> saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you that this beverage has become the precious saving blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. The blood of our Lord Jesus shed for you in celebration of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, 
for the remission of all of your sins, past, present, and future. In the name of Jesus, our Redeemer and Savior, the Christ, we pray. Amen. Partake of the blood of our Lord and Savior. You know, the Lord's Supper is a feast, a feast in union with the living believers and the living Savior, whereby we spiritually and by faith receive Christ with all of his benefits, and we're nourished with the vibrancy of his life into eternal life. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Raise your hands for the blessings. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. May you open up your mouth and continually declare who you are in Christ Jesus, thanking God for all that you've received and give honor, glory, and praise to the Lord Most High. May the Lord continually bless you with divine health and wholeness and make your way prosperous as you walk in his love. In the name and majesty of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you, folks. Dr. Stephanie every Sunday at 7 p.m. here on Spreaker.com for Evensong Worship. Evensong work Service is an extension of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International, a 501c3 organization. God bless you.